we're going to, uh, I think maybe the next sutta week to do is the Ratapala Sutta. <laughs> Um, there's only two suttas left, uh, and we have three sessions left, so we'll see what happens. Uh, that's okay. It doesn't matter. There's plenty to talk about anyway. Um, but this is one of my favorite little suttas. Uh, well, I've said this every time, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, nice. It has a, what is called four summaries of the Dhamma, and these four summaries are actually very nice, succinct ways of thinking about the Dhamma, and this is why it is so nice. And the story around it is also a very sweet story, an interesting story. I, you can read it yourself, I don't think I will, there will be time to tell the whole story of Ratapala, but if you go to that sutta, you can see this is, M, we are now on page 60, page 60 by the way, and uh, you can see MN82, my middle length sayings, uh, uh, number 82, if you go there, you should be able to find it. You can find it online. You can probably just type in into Google, actually, MN82, and you'll probably come up straight away, I would think. Uh, if not, then Ratapala will, will do the job. Uh, and uh, so it's a very sweet story about this uh, young man who goes forth. Uh, he is said to be the one foremost in faith among the Buddha's disciples, uh, because he literally lies down on the ground, uh, and he says to his parents, either you allow me to go forth, or I will die right here on the ground. That's what it says. Uh, his parents are reluctant, yeah? So if you ever want to go forth, uh, is there anyone here who wants to go forth who has uh, having problems with permission with his parents, Jerry? Are you <laughs> no, this, this, is the, this is the method, yeah? You lie down on the ground. No, no I'm, just, I'm, just being, I'm exaggerating here. You just do whatever is appropriate. <laughs> so, uh, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Excellent, thank you. So, uh, is your mum here, Terry? Or is she not here? No, not here. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm being very naughty today. So we just. Uh, but uh, so this is. So he became then famous for the one with foremost in confidence. Yeah, and um, uh, it's because of that that he was so determined to go forth. And then there's a long story about him coming back to visit his parents after he's become an arahant. Uh, and of course, things aren't quite the same again when you become an arahant, it's a bit different. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting story. And then after <coughs> he's finished with his uh, parents and talked to them, then he goes to this place. This is like a garden or a park, and this park is owned by the king. So he's kind of hanging out in the park, uh, and then uh, the king uh, de uh, decides to go and see him. And there's this conversation between the king and Ratapala. Ratapala literally means the guardian of the country. Ratta is the country, Pala is like a guardian. So uh, um, he, um, uh, the conversation of Dhamma between the king and Ratapala that this really is about. Yeah? So it's always exciting when the kings uh, come into this, uh, because then you have to give some more hard-hitting Dhamma, I suppose, uh, to kind of excite the kings uh, about what's going on here. So, thank you for the tea, it comes in very handy on, on days like this. Uh. So this is where the uh, story takes up, and where we start the story. It's already a long story already, but this is where we begin here. And already I have included quite a lot this time, I can see, of the sutta. So uh, we'll see how it goes. So. Then King Kuravya, page 60. Uh, in other words, the king who ruled this garden addressed his gamekeeper thus. Um, in other words, the park keeper, yeah, basically. Yeah. Good gamekeeper, tidy up the Migachira garden so that we may go to see the pleasure. We may go to the pleasure garden to see a pleasant spot. This is very. This is not good translation. Wouldn't you agree? No, wh whoever says anything like that in real life, we want to see a pleasant spot. Does anyone ever say that? No, it does not happen. It's supposed to be natural language, my opinion. We should go and tidy up the garden so we may. Uh, we may enjoy it or something like that, maybe it might be a better way of putting it, uh, but this is not even English. It's like, this is what they call Buddhist hybrid English. Uh, we <laughs> you turn the English into some r artificial language just to kind of fit with the Pali, that's basically what it is. Uh, so, this, this is Vicky Bodhi, yeah? Not good enough, in my opinion. <laughs> I'm 
That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I know, I know straight away. I know the style. I can tell from the style straight away. I know who it is. Uh, I, I know. Yeah. And uh, but I, I, I'm not really being critical because it's very hard to translate. Uh, and when you translate, it's very easy to fall into the rhythm of the Pali. So you translate directly, and it's very difficult to catch yourself sometimes. So I don't really mean this to be critical. What I mean to say is that any translation is going to have limitations to it. Uh, and uh, when my translation eventually comes out of the Vinaya, people are going to criticize that one as mad and say, "Whoa, what on earth are you doing?" Yes, why? <laughs> Ajahn Brahm said that um, the only people who can criticize or give opinion about the translations are those who have deep meditation. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, that, that depends a little bit on what you are criticizing as well. Yeah? If you're criticizing these aspects of the Dhamma, I, I sort of agree. But if you criticize more superficial things, it's a bit different. Uh, so it really depends on what it is. But you have a point. Uh, and uh, especially with Ajahn Brahm's translation, perhaps, because he is kind of d doing things his way. Huh? But uh, of course, I, if I have to be honest, I would probably uh, not... <laughs> no, I'm not going to be honest, I'm not going to be quiet, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> oh, yeah. This is the problem with being Norwegian. If you're Norwegian, you tend to say things direct. You kind of are too direct sometimes. Yeah, okay, hold back, hold back. The, this is one of those important points. So. It's strange, yeah, in, in uh, Europe, such a small place, and the difference between the countries is often very enormous. The British are more like uh, the Thais, yeah, and that they are not in very indirect, you can't say things directly. And you go across the water, you go to Norway, people are exact opposite, like Germans, very direct. Uh, it's really weird, it's like this tiny place, and actually large differences in culture. But anyway, that's completely irrelevant from what we're talking about, so let, uh, let's get back to like back to business. On the last day, sometimes of a retreat like this, things get a little bit more out of hand, and, and it starts out very controlled, and it gets more and more, <laughs> it more random, which is which is perfectly okay. And if you would like to ask questions as we go along, please feel free to do so at any time. We have quite a bit of time today, so we have time to take any any questions or comments you would like to make. So prepare uh, the. Uh, pleasure garden, so we can go and enjoy ourselves. Yes, sire, he replied. Sire is this ancient way of uh, talking to a king. Now, while he was tidying up the Miga Chira garden, uh, the gamekeeper saw the venerable Ratapala seated at the foot of a tree for the day's abiding. The day's abiding is like uh, just what they did after the meal. They would abide in meditation. That's what it means. It means, really means for the day's meditation would be a better translation. Uh, the reason why he used the word abiding is because the Pali word is vihara, but vihara is also used uh, as a word for meditation practice, like Brahma vihara, uh, divine abiding. It literally refers to meditation. It doesn't refer to kind of, you know, um, just hanging out or anything like that. Uh, so for the day's meditation is a, is a better translation because you actually understand what is, what is meant. Whereas day's abiding, unless you are initiated, you don't really know what that means. Uh, so just being critical again. Huh? <coughs> when he saw him, he went to King Koravia and told him, Sire, the Miga Chira garden has been tidied up. The clansman Ratapala is there, the son of the leading clan in this same Tula Kotita. That's the local town, of whom you have always spoken highly. He is seated at the foot of a tree for the day's meditation. Then, good gamekeeper, enough of the pleasure garden for today. Now we shall go to pay respects to that master Ratapala. Then saying, give away all the food that has been prepared there, King Kuravia had a number of state carriages prepared and mounted one of them. Accompanied by the other carriages, he drove out from Tula Kotita uh, with a full pomp of royalty to see the venerable Ratapala. He drove as far as the road was possible for carriages, and then he dismounted from his carriage and went forward on foot with the following of the most eminent officials to where the venerable Ratapala was. Sounds like a king, doesn't it? He has all these officials with him and everything. It sounds like the, the real deal. 
and uh, then he exchanged greetings when the Ratapala and when the courteous and amiable talk was finished, uh, he stood at one side and said, Here is an elephant rug, let Master Ratapala be seated on it. <coughs> so one little point to make here is that you will notice this is a standard way they talk about things in the suttas. It often happens in precisely this way. They mount the carriage and then they obviously have horses and horses will, will they draw the carriage and then they will go as far as the road is possible and then they will dismount and go on foot. And this is the same every time. So why is it like that? And the, the reason is that uh, the monasteries in those days and the places where monks would hang out uh, would be away from ordinary civilization. Yeah? The road would not be able to go all the way to where they were staying. There would always be a distance on foot. And this kind of symbolizes the idea that monastics were dwelling in the forest, uh, away from civilization. Yeah? So that's why they always approach on foot. Even kings approach on foot all the way through the suttas. Uh, uh, no, no one ever drives all the way up to a, uh, a monastic place. So this shows you again the idea of the forest dwelling. Yeah? It's kind of implied there. It's not kind of stated directly, but it's implied by the way the language is used. So you have to, it's hard to notice these things unless you are really used to these texts. I'm very used to these texts, so I notice little details like that. Most people wouldn't see it because it's, uh, it doesn't stand out all that much. And then you will also notice how they always exchange greetings, yeah? friendly greetings, courteous and amiable talk. They're always friendly with each other, they're not kind of abrupt or they don't uh, take this idea of, of the fourth ac kind of right speech too far, uh, not to say anything, um, uh, anything frivolous. Uh, being kind and exchange greetings is not frivolous, it's part of kind of common courtesy, so you always do that. Uh, and this happens throughout the suttas as well, both among the monks, between monks and lay people, and between lay people. Um, and then he presents an elephant rug to Master Ratapala, and Ratapala says, There is no need, Great King. Sit down, I am sitting on my own mat. Because elephant rugs were not allowable for uh, monks, that's why he says that, uh, that's the reason. It's a little thing, yeah, it's, uh, you almost wonder why they have included that. Uh, why is that even there? Why do, what was the point of saying this? And, uh, it's hard to really know, except that maybe it is historical, maybe it's true, maybe it really happened that way. So maybe they kept that in there just to keep that historical record, uh, otherwise it's really difficult to understand why that sentence is even included. It uh, doesn't seem to make any difference. Anyway, I don't know if you find that exciting or not, uh, but uh, to me it's a bit exciting when I see these kind of things. I think, gee, that's very interesting, why is it there? because uh, maybe I've been studying too much, maybe it's time for me to chill a little bit. Uh. <coughs> okay. King Kauravya sat down on a seat, made ready, and said, Master Ratapala, there are four kinds of loss. Because they have undergone these four kinds of loss, some people here shave off their hair and beard, put on the ochre robe, and go forth from the home life into houselessness. What are the four? There are the loss through old age, the loss through illness, the loss of wealth, and the loss of relatives. And so this is, was kind of a standard way, and you see that even in the present day in India, that uh, people, when they go forth, usually it's because lay life has become meaningless. Yeah? Lay life, okay, I've lost all my wealth now, I don't have any relatives to look after me, I'm getting sick and old, so what's the point of being a lay person? Yeah? Okay, I guess I might as well be a monk then, yeah? what else can you do? Huh? And uh, that happens even now. Yeah? Sometimes you get some of the older disciples we have in Perth, they say, okay, yeah, I've come to the end of my life, my partner has died, might as well become a monk or a nun. And a few, one or two people have ordained on that basis. Uh, and that's okay, there's nothing wrong with that, really but it's not the ideal way of uh, living the monastic life. And this is kind of the point that is being made here. This is a standard way for people to think, but it's not the best way to think about monastic life. Uh, because really, 
monastic life and the spiritual path, this is the meaning of life. Everything else is hollow. And this is what this sutta is ba about, to show how other things are really the hollow part. So once you get that, then of course the right thing to do is to become a monastic when you are young, when you are strong, when you have the ability to meditate properly and do all the right things. That is the right, right way, not to wait till you are 60 or 70, because then, you know, most of your vitality and strength is, all, is gone. You won't be able to commit yourself so fully. So this is a different way of thinking and this is why Buddhism is different. The point here is that Buddhism gives an angle on spirituality that makes it meaningful from the very beginning. Even when you're young it makes it meaningful and powerful because it is about fundamental aspects of what makes life meaningful and therefore always valid. And what is loss through old age? Here, Master Ratapala, someone is old, aged, burdened with years, advanced in life, come to the last stage. He considers thus, I am old, aged, burdened with years, advanced in life, come to the last stage. It is no longer easy for me to acquire wealth or to augment, to add to the wealth I already have. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard, put on the oak robe and gone forth into houselessness. Because he has undergone that loss through old age, he does do exactly that. This is called loss through old age. But Masratapala is now still young, a black-haired young man endowed with the blessing of youth in the prime of life. Master Atapala has not undergone any loss through old age. What has he known, or seen, or heard, that he has gone forth from the home life to houselessness? In other words, it's a miracle. You have everything. You are young. You, how, on, how on earth have you decided to become a monk? Are you mentally deranged or something? What, what's going on with you? And he is interested in Dhamma, he wants to find out, yeah, because obviously Ratapala is a, an inspiring monk, that's kind of the point here. And in fact he is an arahant already at this stage, so he would, would be very inspiring, no doubt. And what is loss through illness? Here, Mas Ratapala, someone is afflicted, suffering and gravely ill. He considers us, I'm afflicted, suffering and gravely ill. There's something slightly wrong about this, isn't it? Uh, because how ill can you be and still go forth? I mean, uh, it sounds like uh, they're on the kind of death's door, when you put it that way. Uh, oh, I'm almost dead, quickly ordain me before I die. Okay, bong, dead. Uh, <laughs> doesn't make any sense. I, I wonder whether that is really a good translation. Anyway, balha means much. I think it maybe means more like orphan, orphan ill maybe. Uh, yeah, instead of gravely ill, I think there's something slightly funny about that. Uh, anyway, it is no longer easy for me to acquire wealth. Yeah, you can see how everything is about wealth. Wealth is number one, uh, and if that doesn't work, okay, then maybe grudgingly we will do the spiritual life. That's kind of how it works out. Uh, so, it is not easy, so let's go into houselessness. Uh, because he has undergone that loss through illness, he does go forth into houselessness. This is called loss through illness. But Master Ratapala now is free from illness and affliction. He possesses a good digestion that is neither too cool nor too warm, but medium. Master Ratapala has not undergone any loss through illness. What has he known or seen or heard that he has gone forth? from home life to houselessness. So he, you are healthy, fit, yeah, in this blessing of youth. You have a good digestion that is neither too cool, not too warm, but medium. Have you got a good digestion, Venerable? Is your digestion medium? <laughs> have, you got, have you got a medium digestion? <laughs> it's very useful. It's true though, because some people have very fast digestion, yeah, they're super thin people, yeah, and uh, sometimes it can be hard for them to live on one meal a day or two meals a day, yeah. whereas other people, they are the, the opposite, yeah. The, so many people have digestive problems in the Sangha, it's quite common, yeah. so to have a good digestion is a very useful thing, yeah. So, um, that actually is a serious point that is made in the elsewhere as well, yeah. so medium digestion is handy, yeah. 
I think I have a pretty medium digestion, so I'm pretty, pretty lucky in that sense. Okay, what is loss of wealth? Here, Mas Ratapala, someone is rich of great wealth, of great possessions. Gradually his wealth dwindles away. He considers thus, formerly I was rich of great wealth, of great possessions. Gradually my wealth dwindled away. I invested wrongly on the stock market. It is no longer easy for me to acquire wealth or to increase my wealth. Therefore, let me go out, let me go forth into houselessness. Because he has undergone gone that loss of wealth, he does go forth into houselessness. This is called loss of wealth. But Master Ratapala is the son of the leading clan, the leading family in the same Tulakotita. Master Ratapala has not undergone any loss of wealth. What has he known or seen or heard that he has gone forth from the home life into houselessness? He is young, he is healthy, and he is wealthy, and still he has gone on, gone forth. Yeah? It's like a conundrum that needs to be resolved. What is the loss of relatives? Here, Master Ratapala, someone has many friends and companion, companions, kinsmen and relatives. Gradually, the relatives of his dwindle away. He considers thus, formerly I had many friends and companions, kinsmen and relatives. Gradually, those relatives of mine have dwindled away. It is no longer easy for me to acquire wealth and money or make more money. So let me go forth into houselessness. Because of that loss of relatives, he does indeed go forth. This is called loss of relatives. But Ra Master Ratapala has many friends and companions, kinsmen and relatives in this same Tula Kotita. Master Ratapala has not undergone any loss of relatives. What has he known or seen or heard that he has gone forth from the home life into houselessness? So he has everything in life, yeah? Everything that people want. He is kind of popular with his friends and family. He's got money. He is pr presumably intelligent as well, and he's kind of got everything going. Uh, why has he gone forth? Uh, what is the point? Why does someone like that go forth? Uh, it's like, uh, you know, you are ready for uh, kind of the everything good in life, uh, and yet you decide to go forth. Uh, and this is the conundrum. So now, this is why this sutta is interesting. It sets up this tension. Yeah, you have everything in lay life, still you go forth. So what could the reason be? And this is why this teaching is kind of interesting. Yeah. And uh, so if you understand this teaching, yeah, basic, basically it means that you will tend to go forth. Yeah, yeah you want to become a monastic. Yeah. That's usually what it means. Yeah. So this is a test for you right now. Yeah. So if you understand what comes up next, uh, then bang. You want to go forth. Uh, is that right? <laughs> we shall see. We'll see what happens. Uh, this is the challenge for you now, yeah? So you really have to listen carefully. If you listen too carefully, you might end up going forward. So be careful. Uh, find the middle way. <laughs> Master Atapala, these are the four kinds of loss. Uh, because they have undergone these four kinds of loss. Some people here shave off their hair and beard, uh, or maybe just the hair. Uh, if they are women specifically, put on the ochre robes and go forth into houselessness. Master Atapala has not undergone any of this. What has he known or seen or heard that he has gone forth? Great King, there are these four summaries of the Dhamma that have been taught by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully awakened. Knowing and seeing and hearing them, I went forth from the home life into homelessness. What are the four? So this is, uh, uh, these are the four summaries, yeah? And uh, this kind of, these are the things that make you understand the power of the spiritual life and why it really matters. Uh, number one, uh, life in any world is unstable. Uh, it is swept away. This is the first summary of the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened. 
knowing and seeing and hearing this, uh, I went forth from the home life into homelessness. Life in any world has no shelter and no protector. This is the second summary of the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One. Life in any world has nothing of its own. One has to leave all and pass on. This is the third summary of the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One who knows and sees. Life in any world is incomplete, insatiate, the slave of craving. This is the fourth summary of the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One who knows and sees. So these are the four summaries. So uh, maybe the translation is not good enough, maybe that's why you're not lining up to become monks already, or nuns. But uh, um, the translations can always be improved upon, right? So it, uh, we have to get the right translation, then people really bang, hit some, and then... Anyway, so let's... Uh, the world is unstable, it is swept away. Yeah, this is the very uh, first one here. Uh, and uh, the idea behind this, of course, is just the idea of impermanence. Yeah? Impermanence, how life, you're kind of running around, running along, you're, it is, things are kind of swept away as you carry on in this world, uh, and there's nothing really to hold on to. Uh, and this is kind of the problem of the world. There's nothing there that will be stable and suitable to hold on to. And yet, we are desperately want to hold on to something. Uh, why do we want to hold on to something? Because we have a sense of self. Uh, that sense of self forces us to hold on to things. Uh, because by its very nature, the sense of self has certain characteristics. And we need to hold on to those characteristics. Uh, and those characteristics of the self, they have tentacles that go into the world and they support themselves by the attachments in the world. So the sense of who you are is defined by external conditions. Your social networks, all of these kind of things, that sense of self is defined itself as. So because of that, you are dependent on the external world for that sense of self, for who you are as a being, and yet that external world is unstable always swept away, always changing. You cannot hold on to it. You're desperate, every one of us is desperate to find something to hold on to, because not having anything to hold on to is terrible. Yeah, if you have nothing in your life, if everything is just chaos, it is really difficult. So we're always trying desperately to hold on to something, and then it d disappears, and then we hold on to something else. Then that goes, and we hold on to itself, something else. And we keep on doing this again and again and again, never finding anything which really lasts. This is one of the biggest problems of life, and why there is just recurring suffering. Every act of attachment must end in suffering. Every time you're attached to something, you're asking for suffering. You're saying, please allow me to suffer. That's what you're saying through attaching. And yet, attaching has to happen. You can't avoid that. The only way you can avoid attachment is by seeing through the illusion of a self. That is how attachment comes to a stop. I always hear Buddhists say, oh, I must be a good Buddhist. I must not attach. It doesn't work like that. You cannot say, I must not attach. You will attach, whether you must or not. Uh, the only way to get away from that is to actually have insight into the nature of the mind. That is the only way to overcome attachment. In the meantime, you will attach, uh, and there's not much choice in it. Uh. So this is the problem, yeah? And once you see that, you realize, whoa, something is going on here. This is scary. There is just this eternal turmoil of going around, things changing, things being unstable, going from one family life to another family life, from one life to another one, always moving around, and in the meantime, crying and despairing because things get taken away from you. The big picture, in, in, in the small run, things may seem fine, but the big picture of life uh, it's actually very different, uh, and it's quite unpleasant. Uh, and it's like standing on a carpet. Uh, yeah, when you stand on a carpet, it's like you're using something solid. You think, oh, solid ground, ooh, I can relax now. So you stand on this carpet, but this carpet is loose. Uh, and then before, sooner or later, nature comes along and starts tugging on the carpet. And when the carpet gets tugged, you lose your balance, yeah? And eventually the whole carpet gets pulled out, and you fall over, and you fall. That's the instability of the world. The world is like this continuous, uh, low 
frequency earthquake which occasionally blows up into big frequencies uh, and then you fall over, you tumble over because the world is inherently unstable and unsatisfactory. Uh, and every time you fall over you hurt yourself. Uh, and then you stabilize for a while, you think you find a nice piece of ground uh, until the world catches up with you again. Uh, sounds very, sounds a bit grim, doesn't it? Uh, but that is, if you look at it from the big picture, you can see why there is a lot of truth in that. You can't see it fully, because it's very hard to see these things fully. If you really saw it fully, you would probably, you know, you really probably would want to be a monk straight away or nun straight away, you, because uh, seeing this fully is very powerful. This is really strong stuff. Uh, but the fact that you can see it even partially is already helpful. Uh, and uh, for many people it is not really a uh, uh, option anyway to go forth because you have too many other things, responsibilities or whatever. So you, but at least it gives you that impetus uh, to understand that there is something in life really worthwhile doing uh, because this is this unsatisfactoriness. You've got to do something to be able to deal with that. Uh, and that is the spiritual path uh, where you uh, change your way you look at things in the world. Uh. So the world is unstable. You can say that, uh, a per, you know. You can say that uh, experience is unstable. Yeah, the world again is just experience. Your experience of the world is out of control. You cannot control it. Uh, it has its own laws that it follows. Uh, and there is nothing you can do about those laws except just try your best to go with the flow and uh, deal with the consequences when they come. Uh, yeah. <coughs> When we see bits and pieces of that, it uh, tends to lead us into some kind of a depression, like mm. it's so hopeless, useless, that kind of thing. Mm. Because I understand that uh, I've read somewhere that the Buddha goes into dispassion and compassion. Yeah. It's quite difficult to flip over from getting uh, dispassion, depression, flipping from dispassion to compassion. Normally, we will go dispassion, depression. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so instead of go to go to dispassion to compassion rather than dispassion to depression. Okay. Um, th I think that one of the points of uh, of understanding this is to reduce the possibility of that depression. Yeah, because you know it's going to happen, and when you know it's going to happen, you actually the way you think about life just changes. Uh, if you know that uh, one day you're uh, dearest people around you are going to die if you know that uh, uh, your, your possessions will get lost one day at the very end when you, when you die. You, you, you kind of have a different attitude to them. This is the idea of the borrowed goods that we talked about before. You think of everything as borrowed goods. Uh, what is your attitude to a borrowed good? It's very different from an attitude to things you own. Yeah? But really everything is borrowed goods. Uh, so everything is thought of in that way. You have it for a while, then it goes back to its Owner, the owner is nature. Nature takes it back, always claims it back eventually. So this is one of those um, simple things that reduces the suffering in life, but it doesn't take it away. You will still suffer when it comes. You will st may still become depressed for a while, but at least it will reduce the problem, and that is the beginning point. And at the same time, what you are doing is you are also building up good qualities in yourself. And that is a cushion when the hard, when the really big crisis comes, it's a cushion to support you, huh? because you have something else in your life that is deeper and more profound. When you die eventually, as I said yesterday, you're going to be alone anyway. Everyone has to die alone. Huh? When you go into your next life, nobody's going to be there with you. Huh? It, so eventually we end up being alone. Huh? So all of these things are almost like reminders of that last point, when you're going to be finally alone. Uh, if you are alone, at the very least, you want to have good qualities in your heart to carry with you. Uh, because that is going to support you at that point, uh, and you feel good about yourself. Uh. So there's this two-pronged approach. On the one hand, understand reality deeply, so that you don't, you, you reduce that attachment a little bit. Uh, you are expecting things to happen, you think of things in terms of borrowed goods, and you build up your own inner strength and independence. One of the things people often, I think, mis uh, underestimate is the power of independence you gain in the spiritual path. Uh, that is why the stream mentor is 100% independent, yeah? but we all become more independent as human beings as we practice this path. And that is a beautiful outcome, you know? To be independent is actually a great thing. Yeah? because it means you are more reliable to look after yourself. 
So that is a part of the answer. I'm sure there is more to it. But, uh, so, uh, but thanks for these questions. You may have known the answer already, uh, uh, Jennifer, but uh, you know, these are uh, good things to be reminded of. Uh. So uh, the second one, life in any world has no shelter and no protector. Uh. This is the second summary of the Dhamma. And uh, the shelter here is, uh, uh, the Pali word is uh, tano, and uh, the protector is abisaro. Uh, and abisaro is related to the word of isara, and isara is a word which means like a god, yeah, a creator. Uh, isara, for example, they talk about the beginning of the universe, uh, and uh, where the wrong view of the Brahmajala Sutta, that you know, a god thought he had created the universe. Uh, so this is one of the places where uh, Buddhist teachings say there is no such thing. There is no Lord, there is no final kind of God who will look after you. There's, this thing doesn't exist. Yeah, and this is so different from how many Christians, especially if you have these people who you know, pray to a personal God, which is very common in Hinduism, in Christianity, and, and Islam presumably as well, and you have a kind of tr try to have a personal connect connection with God, but what if there is no God there who listens? Yeah, what if it is just kind of some idea of the mind? And this is precisely the problem according to the Buddha. There is nobody who listens. You may ask the God to help you, but in the end you end up despairing because it seems like God isn't listening. Please help God. And then you have even more suffering. Yeah, and then it feels like despairing, so we need another solution. That solution isn't sat satisfactory if you are praying to a God who doesn't exist. Uh, then after a while it feels terrible, yeah. And so there is another solution, and the other solution is that you have to take responsibility for your own life. You can't put your life in the hands of some kind of super duper power who is going to look after you. You have to take responsibility yourself. And initially that may seem scary because you feel kind of, we all feel a bit small and weak yeah, in terms of the cosmos is so large, uh, we don't feel we have much power to do anything. Yeah. But uh, the point is that actually it is a very liberating thing uh, to take responsibility for your own life. It is liberating because we don't know who this God is anyway. If the God is there or not we don't know. If there is a God we don't know what kind of God it is. If you read some of the Christian scriptures, like the Old Testament, uh, there is good grounds for having some doubt about how good that God is. You know what I mean? I mean, some of the things that God did according to the Old Testament is pretty bad. It's better to have faith in the Buddha. The Buddha seems to be much better than this God in the Old Testament. Uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm just... Uh, I'm <laughs> I'm just saying what I read, yeah, if you read these things, that God kind of punishes and God does bad things and God is jealous and God tells the Father to kill the Son, and it's kind of really weird stuff. And this God, and so who is this God that we're praying to anyway? We just don't know. It's just so random, yeah, it's so unreasonable and so uncertain. And uh, I, my point is not here to put down Christian people because there are lots of really good Christian people in the world. Uh, my point is more to try to reflect on some of these beliefs, whether they really make sense or not. That is kind of the point here. Uh, and from a Buddhist point of view, right here, no, this is the wrong approach to leading your life. Uh, so because you don't know what you are praying to, you don't know what you're asking for favors for, uh, much better to take responsibility for your own life, uh, yeah? Because that, you have a power to do something with your own life. You can do something with your own existence. You can decide whether you want to be kind or not. You can decide, at least to some extent, whether you want to think like this or think like that. So you're taking back, you're empowering yourself, taking charge of your own life. This is the beauty of this. Instead of leaving it into the hands of some unknown quantities, isn't that really quite unsatisfactory to leave your life into the hands of an unknown quantity like a god? Even if, you know, we just don't know. Maybe, I, I, I have absolutely no faith that there is any God out there, but even if you may think, oh, maybe there is a God, who knows? Uh, still, it is just so uncertain. Yeah. And this is part of the problem. So take back some of that responsibility. 
Empower yourself and make sure that you take charge of your life. You learn to live your life in the right way. Then you are empowered. A far better way of living. It's scary initially because you, you feel like you are suddenly kind of more naked and you know, oh, I don't have any protection, whatever. But actually, in the long run, it's empowering. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, please. About relying our life on gods. Mm. Is there anything in the Sutta that mentions the Sakya kings, which uh, we hear so much about, and then the four heavenly kings, and you pray to the four yes. directions? Can you elaborate or give us some insight on that? Thank okay. You. Yeah. So uh, yes, there is. Uh, you know, you have the four great kings and the kind of the realms of gods that are very close to the human realms, uh, and there is even the idea in the Sutta, as in a few places, where you kind of give a. It's called a deva baling. It's like a an offering to the deva is mentioned in a few places and occasionally it may even seem like a deva may protect you in certain cases and that whole tradition has then led to buddhism often become based on this kind of idea that you know we we look after the gods we give them little gifts and then we kind of and we it's almost as if buddhism is becoming more like hinduism yeah because this is exactly what hinduism is like you have your personal god you pray to them they support you you support them but we have to be very careful because this is a very marginal thing in the suttas. It's very rare. And some of the ideas in the suttas have crept in from the outside. We know that because that has been shown by comparative study that some of these ideas are kind of come in from the outside. So we can expect that some of the ancient Indian ideas will have made their way into the suttas. And if you generally look at the Buddha's teaching, there's nothing really about this. There's noth this is not at all, this is a very peripheral, it's not core teaching of the Buddhism at all. Uh, so I would say that, generally speaking, forget about those suttas. They're not important. Uh, they are side issues, they are marginal things. Uh, and we end up with a kind of Buddhism that you find in many places in the world where praying to gods becomes kind of big thing again in Buddhism, and it is actually a very big thing in parts of Asia. I think in Thailand many people do this, is that right, Aya? It's quite a common thing, putting out um, things for gods or for, for, for petas or, and that sort of thing. Is that a... Not very common. Not very common, okay. In Sri, yeah. in Sri Lanka it's much more common, I was going to say that, yeah. Certainly in Sri Lanka it is very common because there's much closer relation between Hinduism there and, and Buddhism. Yeah. So uh, I would say don't, don't forget about that side. of uh, uh, the, uh, You're right, there is occasional mention of that in the suttas, but it's too occasional to really make anything uh, serious out of it. Uh, yeah. <coughs> so these are good questions because they kind of bring up some of the uh, con controversial issues. Yes, Niwan. <laughs> Well, I think uh, I, I, just just yeah. building on the question uh, mm. of um, I think the, there's a fine line between hopefulness and hopelessness. Uh, yeah. If I may use those words, uh, I think uh, uh, while we say that these things give us hope because we understand the impermanence and the 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 fact that things we can't hold on to, which yeah. is very helpful. Uh, as far as if you understand the fundamentals are concerned, yeah. but uh, what if the person that we let's say we know that they don't have these fundamentals and they sort of get into the situation where they get depressed maybe mm -hmm. uh, and how do we I mean for people like us we, we are brainwashed early <laughs> uh, but yeah. We, yeah. we can't brainwash somebody if, if, they, if, yeah. they, if they are in really in that situation um, and yeah. then going to tell them about the philosophy of life sometimes uh, will drive yeah. them even wor worse in absolutely so, so how do we yeah. how do we balance these things and how do we yeah. sort of you know give them that hope uh, without you know driving them to the other extreme yeah. you know? well, this is the thing it, it is very hard for people you know and, and this is exactly the problem unless you get onto the spiritual path early on it is going to be difficult and it's i think almost inevitable that for the majority of people it is going to be harder but there are still things you can do, and what you have to do is use more, as you say, more gentle techniques. Yeah, you can't kind of give them hardcore Buddhism when they're already depressed. It's just, you know, they're going to make it even worse, probably, as you say. Yeah? So you have to use more gentle, and there's a lot of gentle teachings that we can use. I mean, here, this is a, 
this is about the suttas. So I hear, I really am going to teach exactly what the Buddha says. Otherwise, I think I'm shortchanging you or something. Uh, don't want, you want value for money, right? <laughs> Usually people want value for money. So you want value for your lunch or whatever it is. So, <coughs> and so the, th the simple teachings are things like, you know, some of Ajahn Brahm's stories are both deep and shallow at the same time. And that is what is so beautiful about them. This too will pass story. Yeah, you know that this too will pass story. Yeah, yeah? everything passes. Uh, and so you, uh, you know, okay, there's a problem, but actually there's always some exit at the other end. You just have to wait. You have to be patient. Endure. Don't give up too easily. Don't commit suicide because you have a problem. You will come out. There's always a light at the end of the tunnel. This too will pass. Uh, the beautiful story of the prisoner who was kind of getting depressed because they got imprisoned. Uh, yeah, and uh, how that works. Good, bad, who knows? is another really nice story. We can understand that on many different levels. Uh, yeah, but the out long-term outcome is often so different from the short-term outcome. Uh. So this, these are the stories that you you would use when people are in really in in trouble and difficulties, uh, and uh, they can be very very soothing, yeah, and very kind of um, very useful uh, uh, because they are so obvious in their meaning, in a sense. Uh. So that's what I would do. But you are right. Be very careful. Sometimes people are so insensitive, and they kind of you go to someone in the, in the hospital, and you say, "What do you expect? Everything is impermanent." You know, I've told you before. You know, you. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that is not going to help at all. Yeah, it's just going to make matters worse. Uh, so you have to be you have to be wise about. It. You have to feel where people are at. And sometimes, you know, to be honest with you, when I teach, you know, like this, I don't know if there's someone here who kind of feels really oppressed by these teachings. Yeah, who feel really terrible. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Please tell Bobby or, or, or Lai, brother Lai, afterwards if you feel super duper. If this is just too much. Because, uh, but I'm, the purpose for me here is to present real Buddhism. Yeah, this is also for people. If people are interested in becoming monastics, for example, these are the kind of teachings you would want. Yeah, so this is kind of from that side. But the public talk that we give in the evening are a little bit less. Yeah, you will have noticed that if you came to the public talks, they are kind of more, a bit more light-hearted. Yeah, and a bit more. Uh, uh, different style in a sense. And you can see there's a much larger group coming to those, yeah? Because people think suttas, oh no, too much. Uh, and maybe they're right. Maybe sometimes it is too much for people <laughs> to hear the suttas. Uh. So, yeah, thank you for that. Thanks for that, uh, Niwan. That's, that's a good point. Uh, and uh, so sensitivity and context and all of that is actually very, very important. Uh. So there is no Lord, there is no God, there is no shelter. There's no way you can hide, yeah? The, the world, the kamma, inexorably just turns around from one life to the next one, from one event to the next one. There's no way to, you can kind of uh, just get away from these things. And uh, so that is the, the other idea here. You, you just have to deal with the consequences and then you carry on and you, you learn as you go along. And it, one of the beautiful things about this is that as you carry on, it just gets easier and easier and easier. The beginning is always the hardest part, trying to learn and to understand. As you put it into practice, it starts to work and this thing actually becomes easier as a consequence. Okay, let's go on to the next one. <coughs> Any, uh, uh, the world, yeah, or, or life in, in the world has nothing of its own. One has to leave all and pass on. This is the idea of death again, yeah? You don't own anything here. There's nothing that you own. You come to your deathbed, everything has to be given up. So again, this idea of, of borrowed goods, so much on our life is borrowed. You have it for a while, bang, it is gone again. And it changes your outlook tremendously when you start thinking like that uh, because you understand what is really valuable, what really matters for the long term. Yeah? That becomes very clear. Uh. And what is so interesting about this, it does, this doesn't mean that we become careless or callous or hard-hearted, that we don't care for people in this world, that we don't look after our family and uh, companions at work or what. Of course it doesn't mean that. It, it means actually the opposite. Uh, it means that it is the care that we put into people that really matters. Uh, instead of um, you know, searching for all the uh, promotions and the uh, 
material happiness through your work uh, or expecting your children to get straight A's at school or whatever, that is not the significant thing whether your children get straight A's. What matters is whether they're happy. Isn't that what really matters? Uh, and sometimes not everyone is going to be equally bright, yeah? But still, if they can be happy, they can have a worthwhile life. Uh, the reason why people are so intent on their children getting straight A's is because it reflects on them. Yeah, my kids, yeah, they are my children, they're getting straight A's, and then you feel proud. And if they, all, if they just get B's all the way through, oh, not so proud anymore. So it really is, it's a bit, it's a selfish in a sense, yeah, this is the thing. It, I mean, I know people don't mean it in a selfish way, yeah, but uh, still, there is a degree of self-interest, vested interest in these things. Uh, but uh, uh, the real love, the real Detachment, the, the, the real way of looking after children is to make sure they're happy. Yeah, this is the real thing, that is the real love, maximizing the happiness for somebody. So if you can live like that, uh, maximizing the hap happiness of people around you, then you're practicing the Dhamma and also creating so much goodness in the world at the same time. Uh, so when you remember this, that you have to leave everything behind, it's just borrowed goods. Uh, really all that matters is how we treat people in the meantime. Treat them well, without too much self-interest, too much vested interest, uh, for the benefit of them and ourselves in the long term. That is all that really is important here. Uh. So your whole life takes on a new meaning when you remember the borrowed goods. Uh. Quality is what matters. Uh. How we do things, uh, the, the heart quality we put into it, uh, that is the important thing. Uh. And uh, outcomes, results are not so important. Material results and these kind of things are not so important. Uh, the process is what matters. Uh. Life in any world is incomplete, uh, insatiate, the slave of craving. Uh. This is the fourth summary of the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One who knows and sees. Uh. Yeah, um, craving, always driving people on. Uh. It is interesting, we think that we are masters, yeah, we can satisfy our craving, and this is what we think is what life is about. I am in charge, I will satisfy my craving. But actually, really, it's the other way around. Craving is in charge, and you are following along like a sheep, and saying, yes, craving, master, tell me what to do. Okay, run here, be restless, work hard, yeah, get this, do that. That's what craving says, and you says, yes, sir, and you carry along exactly like craving, what, what craving wants you to do. And you feel like you're in charge, but actually you're not. If you really were in charge, you wouldn't want to have any craving, because craving is a pain in the bottom. Craving is dukkha, yeah? That is the point. And uh, if you really understood craving, if you really, and you, and you can see that in meditation sometimes, when you become really peaceful and there's no desire there, that's when you start to feel complete. That's when you start to feel fulfilled. That is when you start to feel for the first time that you're finding something meaningful. Whereas when you are craving, you're always running around, seeking for something else, uh, never being satisfied. Uh, you are a slave, you're not the master at all. Uh, we get these things so wrong. Uh, this is so interesting. Uh, and uh, a lot of that wrongness comes from the sense of self, because the sense of self wants to do. Uh, because the sense of self wants to do, the sense of self is in cahoots with the craving. Yeah, They're working together to trick us. <laughs> So the sense of self says, yeah, I want to act, I want to pretend that I get something done. And then craving says, yeah, that's right, yeah, I'm going to make you work really hard. And then they kind of work together like that. And both of them are just delusions. Uh, so the both of them are kind of creating this, uh, uh, this um, artificial truth, that is or falsehood, uh, which isn't true at all. And then it makes us run around and just experience dukkha as a consequence. But when you get into your meditation, uh, you start to become peaceful. Uh, you start to see, understand what a peaceful mind really is. Uh, you start to understand the con man and the con woman that craving actually is. Uh, it doesn't take you where you want to go. It tells you you will be satisfied, but you will never be satisfied. Uh, and that is precisely the problem. Uh, and this is one of those amazing things about having a deep sense of meditation experience. Uh, once you've had one deep, really deep meditation experience, uh, you know that this is really satisfactory. You know this is what you wanted all along. This is what you wanted craving to give you. But craving could never deliver. Craving was lying. 
Craving says, you will be satisfied when you get this, but you never will. And then you have one deep meditation experience, and wow, this is it. This is what I wanted. You've been looking in the wrong place all the time. Yeah, this is why we call it wrong view. Looking in the wrong place again and again and again. And one day you find everything you ever wanted, but in a very different place. And this is the magic of the Dhamma. This is the magic of the path, that you actually find that profound meaning in this way. So craving is insatiate. You always want more. You're never really happy with what is going on. You are a slave to it and you always feel incomplete inside. You're always waiting to fill up that uh, last thing inside of you to make you feel complete as a person. But craving uh, then drives you on to try to fill up and a psychological lack with external things and a psychological lack can never be filled up by external phenomena and that is why this craving doesn't really work. So, Ratapala says, Great King, these are the four summaries of the Dhamma that have been taught by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened. Knowing and seeing and hearing them, I went forth uh, from the home life into homelessness. <laughs> so, that is uh, the exposition uh, from my point of view of these four summaries. Uh, and uh, later on we shall uh, quickly go through how Ratapala explains them as well, because the king doesn't really understand. So uh, Ratapala is going to explain them to the king, so we can see that explanation as well, just to draw out the meaning maybe a little bit more. So we'll do that after lunch. So please have a nice lunch together. No, actually after lunch is questions, is it? Yes, yes? okay, so Q&A after lunch, and then uh, more, more stuff later on. Oh, okay, yeah. Good, so have a nice lunch, and we'll see you back again at 1.30.